10 o'clock, we're going to get started. Uh, before we do get started, uh, there's a lot of new faces out here I don't know, and you probably don't know me, and some folks do know me. Uh, my name is Anthony Hopkins. I go by Tony. My wife Carol's over there, and John, my son, and Grace, the little one, you'll see her running around. She's up at the other building. Um, we were here, well, I got saved in 2014. We came here in 2014 under pastor's uh, ministry, called to preach under his ministry. We went away for about four years, and preacher called me the other day to ask to come teach Sunday school for him. So it's a great honor to be back here. Um, really didn't honestly know what the Lord's going to do, but here we are. And so it's, uh, it's good to be back here and be able to teach the Word of God. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Brother Barry, would you open us up in prayer, please? Our Father, we bow in the presence, Lord, we ask you to come into this place. I pray you touch my brother who teaches the Word of God. I pray you'd open our hearts this morning that we might receive what you have for us. Lord, for all that you do this day, we'll give you the praise for it, which in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We on here? Okay. All right, if you will, open your Bibles to Acts 11 and verse 26. It's probably a little hot, isn't it? Acts 11, verse 26. And the Bible says, and when, he, and when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So I want to teach a message. Can you still hear me? Good. I want to teach a message. Um, it's called Salvation Salvation versus Discipleship. Salvation versus Discipleship. And then that's going to lead in some things. We're going to talk about gifts versus rewards, and then we're going to talk about sonship versus fellowship, Okay. So we just read in Acts eleven twenty six the Christ, they were the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, okay. So that tells you right there that a disciple or a Christian is a disciple. Now here's the here's the main crux of the matter, is that salvation is a free gift. We understand that being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, right? That's Romans three twenty four. So you have and, and, and why I'm teaching this and why it's important that you understand because. Um, Lord's given me a little education as I've been away, and, and one of the things that hinders a lot of Christians is not understanding the differences between some things in the Bible. Uh, you get a lot of denominations that think that you can lose your salvation. Uh, you can't lose your salvation if you're born again in the Spirit of God. You can't lose it, but however, there's some things you can lose. Okay, and so salvation is a free gift. You're, you're sealed by the Holy Ghost. That's Ephesians 1.13. We understand that, okay? And I'm going to go more into that. But discipleship is going to cost you something. Okay, so you need to understand those two differences. <clears throat> okay, so when Paul says, that, talking about rightly dividing the word of truth, which I'm sure most people in this church are familiar with 2 Timothy 2.15, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, it's not just, he's, Paul is not just talking about first advent versus second advent, those kind of things, and when you're dealing with prophecy, which he is talking about those things, but in order to understand the Word of God, you have to discern between things that are different. Things that are different are not the same. I was taught that a long time ago, and, and Dr. Ruckman had taught, taught that, and, and you know, yes, I'm a Ruckmanite, and so that, that just throws people for a loop, and they start getting mad about that, but that's okay. But I just want you to understand um, some things here. So... When we're talking about salvation, we're talking about discipleship, they're two different things. Now go to Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to show you something here. Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to read a couple different verses here, then we're going to compare them. Matthew chapter 10. Let's look at verse 37. Chapter 10, verse 37, he says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross, notice the personal, and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now, if you just read that verse by itself, you would think, man, this is uh, sounds a whole lot like um, i got to do something to be saved. Right? Well, let's look at the sister passage in Luke 14. See, when you're reading the, when you're reading the Gospels, 
You have to compare all the Gospels because one will tell you one detail that another one will not. Okay? And so, like right here in Luke 14, go to verse 25. It's just like um, in the book of Revelation, okay? You've got four accounts of the same thing told from different perspectives. Okay, that's important to understand. Just like in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to have different accounts told in different ways. Some might add some detail, some might take away some detail. Like in, I use this example of the Maniac of Gadara in Mark chapter 5. Most folks are familiar with that. But you'll look over there in Matthew, and there's actually two of them. Okay? And so you have to read all the Gospels to get that. Okay? So look at Luke 14, verse 25. Look what he says. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay? You see, what he's talking about there is discipleship. So, many times that, that verse gets used. Where's my thing? Here it is. Many times those verses get used and they kind of uh, almost pressure you into certain things. And, and, and I've seen it happen with preachers where they'll, they'll preach a message based on that scripture in Matthew 10. And they'll try to make you think, well, if you're not like me, you're not saved. And every good Baptist thinks, well, just what makes you spiritual is because you don't drink, cuss, or smoke. Okay, because those are the things you can see on the outside, but whatever, how, what's going on on the inside, okay? And that's what matters to the Lord, okay? So if a person's saved, it's a free gift. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 15. We're going to see this in type with Abraham. Go to Genesis chapter 15. Look at verse number 6. Genesis chapter 15, verse number 6. Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord and is counted to him for righteousness. Okay? Notice that right there. You'll notice that that word, believed, that's the first time it shows up in your King James Bible. First mention right here. Genesis 15, 6. Did he have to do anything to receive that? He just believed what God said. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How would you get saved? By believing what God said. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, and a lot of people call that easy believism. I said, well, okay. What about the Ethiopian eunuch? Acts 8, 37, which all the new Bibles take out. What did he do? He believed what Philip preached. What did he believe? He, well, he preached to him from uh, Isaiah 53, the blood atonement for justification. And he believed what he was reading, and he preached to him Jesus Christ, and he believed on him. And guess what? He was saved. And he received the Holy Ghost before baptism. That's a different lesson, okay? But I want you to understand Genesis 15, 6. It was free. Did Abraham have to do anything? Nope. God put him to sleep. Here comes that lamp. Right? Cuts a sacrifice down the middle. That's a covenant. Right? We understand those things. But understand that thing was a free gift. Now let's look at the other side. Let's look at Genesis chapter 22. Let's look at discipleship in type. Cost something. Okay? Discipleship will cost you something. Notice I'm saying in type. Okay? It's not a doctrinal thing here, but the Lord's giving you things written for your, your learning and your admonition in the Old Testament. You can teach so you can learn some lessons from things here in the Old Testament. Look at Genesis chapter 22. This is, if you know your Bible, you're familiar with the story. This is where Abraham's going to, he's going to offer up Isaac. Okay, look at Genesis 22 and verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. All right? That's the first time the word worship shows up in your King James Bible. Okay? That's another first mention. There's actually six in this chapter, but I'm just going to cover two of those. Now go to Genesis 22 and 18. Genesis 22:18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Okay? 
Is that word right there? Obeyed. That right there, first time that shows up in your King James Bible. So what that shows you is that worship, true worship, is connected to obedience, and it requires a sacrifice. Amen? Now, go over to 2 Samuel chapter 24, I believe it is. 2 Samuel 24. Look how the Lord ties these things in. 2 Samuel 24, 24, easy to remember. Very familiar story. It says, And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Now, if you know your Bible, you understand that that's the same place that Isaac was taken up to be sacrificed at Mount Moriah. This is the same place where Calvary is at. So you see in type, the Lord Jesus Christ, notice that it says, that which doth cost me nothing. Now, it's a free gift for you and I, but for the Lord Jesus Christ, it cost him everything. Amen. For God the Father, it cost him everything. Amen. See, we get it free. He had to pay for it. Okay, so I use this illustration a lot of times. Okay, and I'm going to use my phone here. <clears throat> so, Brother Ronnie, I got a gift. Okay. I'm going to give it to you. Okay, I paid for the gift, right? I'm going to give it to him. Now it's up to him to receive it. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even then that believe on his name. See, oftentimes when, you're, when, when Jesus Christ, he's offering the free gift, what do people do? They reject it. But is it a, is it a real offer? Yeah, is it legitimate? So what if some didn't believe? Guess what? The offer is still legitimate. Every Sunday that a pastor gets up here and he preaches a message and he, he gives an invitation. If anybody's not saved, come down and get saved. Is the offer, is the offer real? Yes, it's a, but it's up to you to take that gift. Right. See, now that's, uh, my, my good friend of mine said it this way, and he may have got it from somewhere else. Salvation is a free gift. Everything after that is sweat equity. You don't have to work. Okay? You understand the difference? So just understand this thing here, discipleship. You know what he's called in James? Friend of God. Why? He was willing to sacrifice. Now, obedience is better than sacrifice. So without obedience first, the sacrifice means nothing. Had Christ not been obedient, even to the death of the cross, his sacrifice would have meant nothing. You understand? You've got to have obedience first, and then you have the sacrifice, and then it's worth something. And God accepts that sacrifice. Okay? So I don't want to beat that thing to death, but I want you to understand the difference here. Free costs you something. Okay? All right. Now, which, I keep losing my rag here. Okay. Now, I want, that leads into the next thing. And we're talking about gifts versus rewards. Okay? Everybody good with this? Okay. Go over to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, I'll get there myself. Romans chapter 4, come on. I think that's in the New Testament. All right, Romans chapter 4. Look at, look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Ah, okay. So Paul's showing you a difference here between gifts and rewards. Gifts and rewards. Okay? Once again, salvation is a free gift, right? For by grace you are saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, or not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? But we're talking about also gifts given to men. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, right? And, and, and the reason that God gave those gifts to men is for the, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, so we see this here. God gives us gifts. Okay, some he made pastors, some he made teachers, apostles, evangelists, so on and so forth. And then you also have 
the, the list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, okay, gifts of service and those kind of things, but those things are given for what? To edify the body, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Those things are free, freely given, okay? You can't glory in something that God gave you, right? That's what Paul tells you. Okay, if he's given you a gift, okay, glory to God, give it to him. Say, okay, he's the one who gave it to me, now let's use it for, the glory of, uh, for his glory. So that's free, okay? But rewards, notice that. You work for reward. Okay, you work for a reward. Go to Colossians. Go to Colossians. Now look, let's look at chapter 3, verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. When you go up one day before the judgment seat of Christ, your works are going to be tried for what sort it is. Why did you do what you're doing? Okay? Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Notice that this thing has to do with service. Okay? Serving the Lord. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Okay? Paul gets on to the Corinthian church over here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because they were drinking and eating the, the they were eating the, the, uh, uh, the Lord's Supper, not discerning the Lord's body, and they weren't judging themselves. Look at verse... Uh, 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among, uh, among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. All right, so he says over here, there's no respect for persons with God. When it comes to these things here, if you want to receive something at the judgment seat of Christ, you better judge your sin down here. Okay? Because there's rewards waiting for you. Okay, up there. You may not get them down here as um, Elisha told Gehazi. He said, it's not time for silver and gold down here. Okay? When he went to go after Naaman the leper... He wanted to get a reward down here, much like Esau. And that's what you see a lot of times with folks that have been given gifts. They want to steal God's glory down here. And they want to get up there and strut around and be the big shot. And guess what? You'll get your reward down there. You'll get the praise of men down there. But when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be a different ball game. Amen? Amen. That, that happens a lot amongst preachers. Amen. I know, because I is one. Okay? good English. Alright, so we understand some things about rewards. Now, look at over here in Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at 8.17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Notice the rewards have to do with suffering. Okay, what did you do for Christ? Okay, so it's going to cost you some things, right? Sometimes it might cost you some family. It might cost you some friends. It might cost you some finances. And lastly, I'm going to put this one in here. It might cost you a ministry. All right? So family, somebody gets saved, it comes from another religion, okay? They might get disowned from their family, okay? If you come from Judaism and you come over here and you believe on Christ, it's, some is a Jew, boy, I'll take, they'll disown them real fast, okay? You're not allowed to evangelize in the Holy Land. That's, that's a shame, but we understand the book and what's going to take place in the tribulation. However, you know, Roman Catholic, Anybody former Roman Catholics in here? Okay. How'd your family think about that? 
Were they happy about that when you came out of that? They didn't understand it. But a lot of times what will happen, if, depending on how devout that they are, they'll disown them. Okay, how about Islam? Muslims. You believe on Christ? They'll cut your head off if you're in their backyard. If the, you're on their home. See, if you do that over here, you know, we got laws against those things. Over there, that's like a sport to them. Okay, so it might cost you your family. How about you, just your family members in general? Okay, you start witnessing to them. They start getting a little weird. They don't want to be around you. Oh, he's going to talk about Jesus. Right? Because you're excited because something happened to you. Something took place. You start to try to win others to Christ. And that's the quickest way to lose some friends. All right? Just start witnessing about Jesus Christ. Guess what? I don't want anything to do with that guy. I'm not an insurance salesman, man. I'm just trying to tell you about what the Lord did for me. But people treat you differently. Right? So your friends... Some of the crowd that you used to hang around with, now they think it's weird that you don't run with them. I'm paraphrasing Peter, but you understand the, the, the type there. You see those things. When you start to witness about the Lord Jesus Christ and you start trying to earn these rewards, people start backing away from you. They think you're a fanatic. They think you're a Bible thumper. Okay? How about your finances? All right? A lot of times this happens in the ministry. Okay? Not just the ministry, might, but the Lord might... Say, hey, I want you to give that job up. I want you to go full time. Well, Lord, I make a good income. Who are you trusting? Maybe you need to take that Isaac up there on the top of Moriah and sacrifice him. Maybe that's what's keeping you, right, from serving God. Maybe it's the finances, man. Um, I mean, a lot of times people get hindered because of this one right here. Because that thing right there is security. Man, I got a 401k. I make good living. Or it's just give it up. I want you to do this. I want you to serve me. I got some better things for you. You're gonna have, you're gonna have to step out on some faith. It's easier, easy to preach, hard to live. Amen. Okay. Uh, how about a ministry? Go to Acts chapter eight. How about a ministry? Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter 8. Look at this over here. Look at 8.5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracle which he did. He's preaching a revival in Samaria. Preaching to the biggest crowds he's ever preached to. Guarantee it. People are getting saved. I mean, is that a good thing? Right? And what's the Lord telling them to do? Look at over here in Acts uh, 8.26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. What are they fighting over right now? Isn't that weird? And he rose and went, and behold, a man of... Uh, 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 a man of Ethiopia and eunuch of great, of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had to come to, to Jerusalem to, for to worship. All right? Look at verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand, understand us, uh, thou what thou readest? When, we just talked about this earlier. What's he... He's, He's reading Isaiah 53, but understand, did you see what Philip did? Did he argue with God? He didn't say, now, Lord, I'm, I'm preaching to all these people, and you want me to go over here? He just ran, just like a lot, he ran. He's God's man. You know why? Because he listens to what God said. He said, I don't care about this ministry that he has for me here. I need to go over and preach to one man who's an African, Cursed is Canaan, according to Genesis 9.25, who's supposed to be a servant of servants. And the Lord said, go preach to him. These Jews over here don't want it. Go preach to him. Right? Now, what's significant about that Ethiopian? That's interesting. If you go back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 39, you're going to see a man by the name of Abedlamech. He's an Ethiopian. And he helps out Jeremiah. And God said he's going to bless him. 
Now what you see over here in Acts, you see the fulfilling of that, of Scripture, God blessing that Ethiopian. Right? Because one man's faith back there 600 years prior, now God's answering prayer up here. He's answering, why? Well, I bless him at bless thee and curse him at curse of thee. Genesis 12, 3 goes back to Abraham. So the, the point is, is that you don't know what God's doing. If he says go to hear and preach to one man, you don't know if that guy's going to be the next David Livingstone. One of the greatest missionaries that England ever had. Right? Or William Carey or some of these other men. All right? Uh, everybody knows Billy Graham. Well, he got saved under Mordecai Ham's ministry at a tent meeting. Well, Billy Graham did wonderful things, didn't he? You know, Billy Sunday got preached to outside of a mission in Chicago. What did he do? Well, he gave up right here. He was a professional baseball player. He gave it up. He was playing for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He said, okay, I'm going to go work for the YMCA. And he made $83 a month. Gave up professional baseball. And what did God do? He used him greatly. One of the greatest evangelists America's ever had. Amen. If not the greatest. You know, didn't make sense, did it? The Lord said, I want you to quit. Sacrifice. And he did. God used him greatly. Okay? So we understand there's some things that you can, that you can earn by working for the Lord. Okay? Now go to Galatians chapter 5. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. And this will lead into our next point. Look at uh, about verse 19. He's going to give you the works of the flesh. Paul is going to give you the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, notice this, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Didn't say they weren't saved. What's it talking about? Inheritance. How do you get an inheritance? By serving the Lord. By working. We don't work to get saved. We work because we are saved. You've probably heard that little phrase. Okay, it's an easy way to remember that thing. But notice here, these folks that are doing these things, guess what they're not going to get? They're not going to get an inheritance when it comes to that millennial reign. Not like somebody who is working for the Lord. Think about this character right here. Demas. He stays with Paul almost his entire ministry and then he forsakes Paul. You'll see him mentioned in Colossians as a fellow laborer. You'll see him mentioned in Philemon. But something gets to him. He loves his present world. He probably goes back to Thessalonica for a business deal or something. And he quits. What's he lose? Discipleship. Does he lose salvation? No. But the judgment seat of Christ, guess what? He's going to lose some things. He quit. It's a very hard thing to finish the race. That's success. Just finish. Just get to the end. Huh? Whatever your ministry is, whatever the Lord's giving you, just get to the end, man. That's it. You don't, have to, you don't have to be Pastor Lawson. You don't have to be any of these other great men of God, right? You just have to do what God's told you to do. Walk worthy of the vocation where you're called. Stay in your lane. Amen? Demas quit. How would you like to have your name pinned down as a quitter in the Bible? I wouldn't. But thank God he gives us the, the, the examples there, right? Okay, and so we understand that there's some things you can lose by getting in the flesh. Doing some things in the flesh. Let's go back to it. Let's look at it again. Look, look at Galatians 5. You think any of these things, you've seen Christians do these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. What's idolatry? Well, that's covetousness. That's putting that before God. Witchcraft, hatred. You ever seen hatred in, in a Christian? Variance, that's arguing all the time. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, that's overthrown governments. Heresies, you ever seen a Christian uh, preach heresy? Amen. 
They sure can. Doesn't make them not saved. They're just a heretic. Amen? But look at those things there. Every single one of these things, you'll notice every one of those has to do with self. If you're not putting yourself first, guess what? That's the stuff that your flesh will produce. Amen? We talk about spiritual, right? Over there at Corinth, he called them babes. They were carnal. Okay? They were carnal Christians. They were little babies. What was going on? Envy, strife, wrath, strife, envy, strife, all those things. They were carnal. Why? They were worldly. Right? They, what did they care about? They cared about self. Okay? Here, here's a good little acronym for spiritual. Jesus first. Others second. Some of you know this one. Yourself last. Right? If you put Jesus first, you won't commit the works of the flesh. You'll walk in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't. Because you put, love the Lord thy God, right, first, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. For all the law is fulfilled in this one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, if you love Jesus first, you'll love, you'll love others right, and you'll put yourself last. You know what we learned in the Marine Corps? First thing you do, you go into the chow hall. If you're in charge, guess what? You eat last. They eat first. You eat last. Leadership 101. Who taught you that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, carnal. It's real simple. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We've got about 10 minutes here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. This know also that in the last days, are you there? You better believe it. Paris time shall come, for men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. That's the church in the last days. What do they care about first? Me, me, me. I, I, I. My ministry. Right? All that stuff. It's pride. That's the work of the flesh. Right? Look at over here. Look at the thing right here. Disobedient of the parents, unthankful, unholy. You say a church can be unholy? Sure it can. How can it be unholy if it doesn't judge sin? That's what makes God holy, isn't it? Righteous? Because He judges sin. Church doesn't judge sin. Guess what? It becomes unholy and it becomes that lay of a sin. Church. Who's, right? Naked, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Can't see. It's blind. Thinks it's good, just like the Corinthian church. They were puffed up. What were they, weren't they doing? Judging sin. What were they thinking about? Self. Right here. You know what the devil wants you to do? What's he want you to worship? Self. You know what the number one holiday is in Luciferianism? It's your birthday. Why? Because it puts you. It's my day. I'm important. Tell you, man, this flesh. Satan's got your pegs, skin for skin, all the man hath we get for his life. Well, that flesh likes itself, doesn't it? You fine looking folks this morning. Right? You don't look like you're out there working in a mud hole all week. You come to church, you want to look good. You want others to perceive you looking good. That's the flesh, isn't it? Now I don't, I'm not saying come in here and look like a mud fence. I'm just saying, you know, you gotta think about this thing here. What demons care about? Self. What do atrophies care about? Self. It's just that simple, okay? Now, last one I want you to look at. Go to 1 John. 1 John. Uh, I think it's about, start about verse 5. We're going to talk about this last one as quickly as I can here. Sonship versus fellowship. Okay, 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, look at it, verse 5, 
This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's a continual cleansing. Understand? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Baptists love that one. All right, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All right, let's talk about this one. Sonship. You've been adopted into the family of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Right? You can't get unadopted. Okay, you can't get out of the body of Christ. Cannot lose. Can't lose this one. Just, okay, salvation is a free gift. Can't lose it. Okay, and just for your edification, the first two chapters in John, 1 John, are about fellowship. The second two are about sonship. Understand the difference. Okay, but fellowship, you can lose. Amen? Amen. You can lose this one. All right, I use this illustration a lot, but you have a husband and wife. Okay. Depending on where their fellowship's at, depends on whether or not they sleep in the same bed together. Okay, they might be mad at each other, sleeping in separate beds, but they're still married. Okay, or take a father and a son. The uh, prodigal son, Luke 15, he never stopped being his son, but they were out of fellowship, which is what the state of Israel is in right now. Okay. So you have to understand the differences between those two. Now, you can lose your, your fellowship by what? Not judging your sin like Paul tell, told him to do. If you want to come into that tabernacle, you've got to go first to the what? Brazen altar? That's Calvary. Then what's next? Brazen labor? And you've got to go to that pool. What's it got in it? It's got water. And you look at it, it's like a mirror looking back at you, which is like the Word of God. But it doesn't do you any good just to look at it. What do you got to do? You have to apply it. You got to wash your hands and your feet. So it doesn't do any good to read the Bible. I'm a Bible believer. Okay, great. Are you a Bible doer? I get so sick and tired of hearing, I'm a Bible believer, and then they don't do what the Word of God says. I don't care how much of this book you believe. How much of it do you do? How much of it do you apply to your life personally? Not sitting there throwing darts at everybody else, but looking at yourself and saying, hey, I need to get washed. I need to get clean. Why? Because I'm out of fellowship. What's that, what's that going to take? Well, you've got to sacrifice your pride and confess your sins. Right? He cleanses, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. See the types? It's that beautiful thing about the tabernacle. So guess what they couldn't do? They couldn't go into the, uh, to the sanctuary to sit down at the, at the table of God, table of showbread, and eat the bread of God and have the light of the Holy Ghost, the seven golden candlesticks, without first getting their hands and their feet washed to come in there. Right? Because that was dirt floor, man. Type of the world. What's, what's the Lord tell uh, Moses to do up there on Mount Sinai? Take his shoes off. That place was holy. What's this from? Egypt. Take it off. Get cleansed. You can't see the Word of God and, until, guess what? You get some fellowship back together and get cleansed. So when we say, well, 1 John 1, 9, you know, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, what's He talking about? Fellowship. A lot of times people get tripped up in those two things. Well, I can lose it. No, you can't. But you sure can lose your fellowship. Amen? All right, these two things are called standing and state. Okay? Your standing is in Christ, seated in heavenly places. Sealed, signed, delivered. That's it. Can't lose it. However, your state can fluctuate like a roller coaster. Based on fellowship. So what's the most important thing for a Christian to have? 
Fellowship. Because you can't win souls if you're not in fellowship. You can't preach the Word of God if you're not in fellowship. And everybody's called to preach, just maybe not at this, at this sacred desk, but you're called to preach out there. You ever been witnessing to somebody and you're in good fellowship with the Lord? And man, you just got liberty. You've been in the book, you've been in prayer, you've been in fellowship with the Lord, and you're just, man, you're just spouting off. Left and right. But guess what? If you're walking in darkness, you can't see it. Amen? All right, so let's recap. Let's re they don't have, we don't have buzzer here, do we? I don't think so. I hate them buzzers. All right. So let's recap. Salvation. What is it? Free. Discipleship. Cost you something. Brother Ronnie's been listening. Cost you something. Okay? Uh, okay. All right, what do we got? Gifts? What are they? Free. If you're giving gifts, what are they here to do? Glorify Jesus Christ in a nutshell. Okay? Rewards? Got to work. If, if any man will not work, neither will he eat. Now there's a spiritual application. If you don't, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, you got to work. Going to get some rewards, you got to work. Okay, and then finally, we just went over at Sonship. Can you lose it? No, can't lose. Fellowship, can you lose it? Yes. Can lose. All right, simple. Rightly divide. Things that are different are not the same. Understand the difference between salvation, di discipleship, gifts, rewards, sonship versus fellowship. All right. Thank you all. That'll be, uh, that'll be the end. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. Okay. Can you all see that, by the way? Okay. All right. It's a little s small of a board. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and just dismiss and... Uh, We'll just go ahead and pray and just thank God for what he's given to us. Father, Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time to fellowship around your word and to get something from you. And uh, just pray for the, for the pastor today. Just pray for him that uh, you'd uh, give him the words that we need to hear, open the bread of life, and uh, feed, feed the flock, feed the sheep. And Father, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.